So today I'm gonna talk something about the improved complexity estimate for Charter Fobler. And it turns out that in the in the panel discussion earlier today, so we have some question um, on like the, the, the connection between the heuristic uh, speed up and the uh, provable theoretical speed up. And this talk will kind of provide a, a perspective to understand this kind of question by showing some kind of uh, provable theoretical speed up for the Charter Fobler. Uh, with two uh, specific examples. So, uh, so basically this talk will cover two works. So the first work is done with uh, Dee and Lin, and another work is a ongoing work and it is joined with uh, Ryan, Dominic, Pedro, Yu, and Yuan. So, uh, so here's the uh, outline for today's talk. That is, we will first, uh, uh, we will first uh, formulate our problem, the Hamiltonian simulation problem, and we'll just briefly introduce the Trotter formula for this problem. And then we will just discuss uh, two uh, improved error bounds for this uh, Trotter formula, which we call the vector norm scaling and, and the application to the adiabatic quantum computing. Okay, so for the Hamiltonian simulation problem, so in this talk, we will uh, basically interested in the so-called the time-dependent Hamiltonian simulation. That is, we want to solve this uh, short equation in equation one. So here we have a time-dependent Hamiltonian, but in this talk, we will kind of uh, restrict ourselves in a specific form that we call the controlled Hamiltonian. So here, the controlled Hamiltonian is a, uh, a linear combination of two simple Hamiltonians, H1 and H2, and the time dependency only come into this kind of uh, Hamiltonian by two scalar functions. That is, this function F1 and F2, they are, they are just scalar functions. So we can see that this is not the most general form of the time-dependent Hamiltonian, but uh, this, this form can still have many, many like interesting application. And also we assume that the Hamiltonian H1 and H2, they are simple so that, uh, the exp so that they can just, um, they can, we can just efficiently simulate the H1 and H2. So this, I would like to remark that this turns out to be a, a highly non-trivial assumption, but also in many, uh, uh, examples of practical interest. So these assumptions can be satisfied. And here for the applications of this model, I just list uh, three of them. So the first is a, a, a very old model. It's called the harmonic oscillator with time-dependent mass and frequency. So basically we just have a short equation with a Laplacian plus a potential term. But in, in front of the Laplacian term, we really have a, um, a mass that is varying uh, with, with respect to time. And the second example is the adiabatic quantum computing, and the third example is the quantum control, and we will go into more details uh, later in this talk. And as I mentioned before, so in this talk, we will only focus on the Trotter formula. Uh, so, so there do exist many um, interesting algorithms that we, which we call the post trotter formula. So for example, the truncated Dyson, the Q-drift or so, and, um, and most of them can achieve a better symptotic scaling compared to Trotter. But uh, Trotter formula is still of practical interest because it is quite simple to implement and the, the numerical performance is, is quite good actually. So, uh, so here's a, a brief introduction for the Trotter formula. So I guess maybe most of us are more familiar with the Trotter formula for time independent case, but for the time dependent case, there are some uh, slight, there are some slight differences. So, so the main difference is that for the time dependent Trotter formula, so actually we have two classes of Trotter formula. So we call it standard Trotter and generalized Trotter. So now to derive the standard Trotter, so the starting point is we start with the uh, exact solution. So the exact evolution operator given in this equation four. So basically this is the uh, exact solution of my uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation. And we can see that in, in this evolution operator, we have a, a, a time ordering operator uh, in front of my exponential. So this time ordering operator is defined using some uh, a Taylor series and can be very complicated. So when, when it comes to the numerical treatment, the first step that we will do is that we will just drop this kind of uh, time ordering operator. So here's the first step that we drop this time ordering operator, and then we can just approximate my exact evolution operator by the exponential of a matrix. And now we look at the exponent in this exponential, we can find that there are still some integrals over the function. So the standard quarter basically take the next step to, to, uh, to be the quarter step. That is, we 
approximate this uh, integral by some a numerical quadrature formula. So here I just use a, a first order quadrature with an endpoint estimate. But if you just want to construct some high order method, you can use high order quadrature and whatever you want. So after that, uh, this becomes a time independent Hamiltonian simulation problem. And then we can perform the standard quadrature for the time independent case, which we call the splitting step. So because we assume H1 and H2, they are quite simple. So we just uh, do the evolution for H1 and H2 separately. So uh, uh, sorry, here is the typo. So here in front of H2, this should be the function f of 2. Uh, so basically, this gave us a uh, st standard quarter formula. And you can actually prove that the standard quarter formula is a first order method, which means that it converges in the first order. But Notice that in this talk, we restrict ourselves in so-called the, the control Hamiltonian, which means that the time dependency, the function f1 and f2, they are just two scalar functions. And it is reasonable to assume that the integrals of the scalar functions can be accurately computed because we can actually do this on our, our classical computer with like a high order quadrature or, or sufficient uh, quadrature nodes. So basically, we will assume that the integral information of the scalar functions are given in, in this talk. So with that, actually, we can just skip the quarter step in the derivation of the standard quarter. And this will give us so-called the generalized quarter, which can be dated back to 1990. So the, the difference between the generalized quarter and standard quarter is that so the standard quarter, the, the function is evaluated as some specific time step. But in the generalized quarter, it is just some integrals. And also, we can prove that this generalized quarter is, is, is the first order. So if we would like to go a little bit beyond the first order, so actually, we can just construct the second order quarter and also even high order method. So here, I just give you the example of second order standard and generalized quarter. And we can see that the construction is in a more symmetric way. That is, we basically do the splitting step in a more symmetric way. And we are using a little bit higher quadrature, higher order quadrature. Uh, and for the and, all, and for the high order method, they are they can be constructed using so called this Suzuki recursion. That is, we have some lower order formula, and then we can do a, a, a multiplication of many low order formula to get a high order formula. But I would like to mention that the high order method are not quite uh, practical because. So because if we see this uh, recursion, so we can say that the high order method will involve many, many terms. So, uh, so quantitatively speaking, it's saying that so the, the terms within the high order quarter formula scales exponentially in terms of the convergence order, which means that so in practice, uh, probably the second order or the fourth order quarter are, are most preferable. And so, so far, what we have talked about just some uh, local uh, approximation, which means that this kind of time h, or we will just call this the time step size h, are kind of small. But if we, if we want to do some kind of uh, long time simulation, then the strategy is that we just divide the, the entire time interval to several small time segments. And then on each time segment, we do the local uh, evolution operator, and then we just uh, 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 stack, them, stack them together. So the global error would be the linear accumulation of the local error. So in the remaining part of this talk, I will just mainly focus on the, the local error. OK, so, uh, uh, so as for the error, so basically for the Trotter formula, there are many, many existing error bounds. But probably most are for the time independent case. But for the time dependent case, there, there are also many existing error bounds. So the most important, the important remark of all the existing error bounds is that so most existing work just try to uh, bound the error using the operator norm. That is, they just try, try to bound the error between the quarter evolution operator and the exact evolution operator. So these error bounds are quite nice because it can just cover all of the scenario using this kind of operator norm error bounds. And it also worked for, for, the, for the most generic case, that is for the general Hamiltonian, it will work. So here I just list uh, three of them and we can see that. So for all of them on the right hand side, uh, we have some H dependence, which is uh, consistent with the order condition. And in the pre-constant, we have some dependence in the spectral norm of the Hamiltonian. So we can say like we have some like spectral norm of H1 or spectrum of H2 or spectral norm of 
the commutator between H1 and H2. And it turns out that all of these error bounds, they are quite, uh, not all, but most of these error bounds, they are quite tight because, so actually we have a difficulty result. That is, we have a lower bound in the time independent case even. That is saying that if we have a Hamiltonian simulation algorithm, which can solve the most generic case, then the worst case error bound cannot, uh, the worst case uh, scaling cannot be better than linear in terms of the operator norm of my Hamiltonian. So uh, this is basically saying that, so, so for the generic case, so the error bounds are already quite nice and there's no much room for us to do further improvement. And in, in, and in light of this, so most recent works really focus on like improved error bounds for some specific examples instead of for the most generic case. That is for some specific examples. So probably we can use the, uh, the property or some, uh, some deeper understanding of that example and then try to derive uh, the error bounds only for that example. But this error bound probably can be tighter than the, than the generic error bound. So here I just list some of the scenarios that we can get some improved error bound. And in this talk, I will, I will discuss two, diff two other scenarios. So the first is the uh, a short equation with uh, a time-dependent mass. And then the second is the Trotter for adiabatic evolution. Okay, so we uh, start with our first application. So uh, remember that we just wanna like, um, just wanna study this kind of Hamiltonian with a time-dependent mass, that, uh, which is specified in this equation eight. That is, we have a Laplacian and we have a potential operator, but we do have some time dependency, some scalar time dependency in front of my operators. So, so the difficulty for this kind of Hamiltonian is that if we look at the operator norm of this Hamiltonian, then the operator norm can be very, very large, which means that the, the error bounds in the operator norm uh, does not give us much useful information. So the problem basically lies in this uh, a Laplacian operator. So we know that the Laplacian operator is an unbounded operator. And even after some spatial discretization, so the operator norm of discretized Laplacian operator can still be very, very large, which makes the uh, error bounds in terms of the operator norm uh, very large and not give us much information. So, uh, and in a more general setting, we in, in, in this part, we will just assume the the operator norm of H1 is much larger than the operator norm of H2, but the example that we are having in mind is that H1 is something like the Laplacian, and H2 is something like a bounded potential. So now we want to get some improved error estimate for this example, and especially we really want to get rid of the dependence of this, uh, the norm dependence on this uh, Laplacian operator. So the key idea for us to get the improvement is that we really want to change the measurement of the error. So like I mentioned before, so for, for many existing error bound, they just use the operator norm to measure the error. But here in our example, we want we, we try to solve the Schroeder equation. So basically we try to get a quantum state or the, the wave function. So, uh, so the error that we would like to study is basically the error within that quantum state. And and another observation is that the operator norm can somehow overestimate the error within the quantum state. So this observation is based on some a simple fact that so mathematically speaking, if we look at the definition of the operator norm, which is in this equation nine, so we can see that the definition of the operator norm is actually the maximum of all possible vector norms, which means that the operator norm error bound is somehow describing the, the worst case scenario uh, but in practice, so typical scenario might not be that might not be that bad. So probably a typical scenario can allow some some nice performance, and then the vector norm can probably be much smaller than the operator norm. So this is the motivation and the key the key idea of our work here. And with that idea, so we successfully proved the error bounds in terms of the vector norm. And here I just show. I just show you the error bounds for the first order standard and generalized trotter, but in our paper, we also show some results in the second, for the second order method. So here for the, yeah, for the first order method, we can see that the local error is given in this um, equation 11. 
So, so the error bound, we can see that, so it's on the order of h square, which is still consistent with my order condition because this is a local error. So the first order has a, a second order local error. But the interesting thing is that we, if we look at the preconstant, so the preconstant only depends on the, the vector norm of my matrix H1 acting on my state, which means that if in some kind of application, so this kind of the H1 acting on the state, if it can be much smaller than the operator norm of H1, then our uh, vector norm error bound can give, can give a better estimate and probably can give some like uh, a better complexity estimate for the Toller method applied to this example. And this is something that I, I will show you in the, in the next slides. That is, we just want to try to apply this kind of uh, vector norm error bounds to our example with uh, time dependent mass and potential. And here we further assume that our potential is bounded and smooth. And this turns out to be a, a kind of a strong assumption. And probably I will just go back to this later and remark on this point. But at this point, we just assume the potential to be bounded and smooth. So, and in this example, so my Hamiltonian H1 again is the Laplacian operator and my, uh, and my Hamiltonian H2 is the potential operator. So, uh, so, uh, so to simulate this on the quantum device, we just do some spatial discretization with the n basis functions. Like, so for example, you can use the uh, central difference formula or use the Fourier basis or whatever you like. But after the spatial discretization can prove that, the spectral norm of my Hamiltonian H1 is on the order of n squared, where n is the number of the basis function that we are using in the spatial discretization. And the, 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 the operator norm of the H2 is bounded by Y because we assume the potential to be bounded. And again, we can see that there is some difficulty in the operator norm of H1 because this can be very large if we want to choose many, many basis functions to achieve some accuracy. But if we look at the operator norm, so remember that in the previous, uh, in the previous theorem, the operator norm error bounds basically depends on the norm of H1 acting on my solution. So now in this example, H1 acting on my solution is actually the Laplacian operator acting on my solution. So it's basically the second order derivative or the second order spatial derivative of my wave function. And since we assume that my potential is kind of smooth, which means that the wave function is also smooth. So the second order derivative of my wave function can be bounded. And in particular, it, in particular, it is bounded independent of the spatial discretization. So which means that the, the vector norm of H1 acting on, the, acting on my solution is on the order one. Although the, vector, the operator norm of H1 itself is, can be very large. So with this, we can say that we can, we can really get rid of the uh, n dependence in our vector norm scaling, and then we can just get some uh, uh, improved complexity estimate, and then we'll just show it in the next slides. That is, so we compare our vector norm scaling with many existing error bounds. Uh, so first, I would like to remark that this is not a quite fair error uh, compar comparison because our work is a vector norm scaling and only work for for some uh, typical nice scenarios, but for other works, they are just vector norm scaling, so they can just somehow cover the worst case. But if, so this compression is basically, we directly apply their generic error bounds to our scenario to see what the scaling they can give. And we can see that. So just like we mentioned before, for other error bounds in terms of the operator norm scaling, so you should have some n dependency due to the operator norm dependency, but in our work, there's no n dependence. And this will give us some, uh, uh, some, some speed up in the query complexity in terms of the accuracy. This is because uh, this number n, the number of the spatial discretization should be chosen according to the, to the tolerate level of the error in the spatial discretization. So here we just get rid of this dependence and then we can just get some uh, better estimate in terms of the accuracy. So here's the uh, comparison with the existing work. And we also verify our work by some numerical tests. And here I'm just showing some a numerical test. So for, for those four lines with slopes, there the errors of those parts are measured by the operator norm. And we can see that they are growing when the when the number of the grids we are using for spatial discretization is, is, is larger. But for those uh, horizontal lines, so the errors are measured in the vector norm and we can see that they are just they, they do not grow uh, when we use uh, more and more grids to discretize my uh, Laplacian potential operator. 
So uh, this is basically for the for the first part of my uh, for the first part of the application. So the the short take home message is that so although the uh, the vet, the operator normal rebound can be nice, they can describe the worst case and they can just cover cover all of the scenarios. So in some nice and typical scenarios, so probably we can just. Uh, change the measure of uh, change the measurement of the error and to get some uh, improved error bound for the quantity that we are really interested in instead of the the most general scenario. So uh, this is for the first part. And next, I will just skip the proof. And next, I will just discuss another interesting application that is uh, the charter for the adiabatic quantum computing. And this is really still an ongoing work. And we'll, I think we will just post the paper later when when it is ready. So I will just uh, start with the brief introduction of so-called the adiabatic computing and just make sure that we are on the same page. So the adiabatic computing, so the goal of this kind of stuff is try to solve a eigenvalue problem. That is, we are given the Hamiltonian and we will just want to try to find a eigenvector or maybe the ground state of that Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So the mathematical model of AQC is that we are given a, a time-dependent Schoener equation in this equation 15. And here, the, the Hamiltonian is a uh, linear interpolation between the Hamiltonian H0 and H1. And the evolution time is up to the capital T. So the adiabatic, theory, the adiabatic quantum computing is based, is based on this kind of fact that is, so if the initial solution of my Schoener equation is a eigenvector corresponding to this uh, H0 Hamiltonian, then under some, under some assumptions, so the final solution of my Schoener equation will be a good approximation of the eigenvector of the Hamiltonian H1, which means that if we start from the eigenvector of H0 and then we solve this Schoener equation and we will end up with the uh, uh, eigenvector corresponding to the Hamiltonian H1. So in practice, probably we are interested in, to, uh, we are interested in solving the eigenvalue problem for the Hamiltonian H1, so what we can do is that we can just try to construct a, a simple Hamiltonian H0 where we know the eigen, eigenvectors for this kind of H0. And then we just do this kind of linear interpolation. We solve the Schroeder equation and everything is done. And we, so, and this can be a really powerful model to compute the eigenvalue problem on quantum device because we know that on quantum device, so the, the time dependent Schroeder equation uh, might be uh, efficiently solvable. And I mentioned that to ensure this kind of things work, so there are some assumptions. So basically, there are two assumptions. So the first assumption is that my Hamiltonian should, should change very, very slowly. That is, so we, we should drive our system from H0 to H1 in a very slow speed. And if we are using this kind of linear interpolation, so this is equivalent to say that my evolution time capital T is very, very large. That is, I just evolved my dynamics for a, for a, for, a, for a long enough time period. And relatively speaking, it's just saying that we are driving our system to be very slow. And the second assumption is a very important one, so-called the gap condition. So the gap condition is saying that, so the eigenvector that we are interested in, so the, the eigenvalue that we are interested in is somehow separated from the rest of the spectrum. So here I just try to illustrate it with a four level example. So maybe you can just see the figure on the right. I just draw the, the, the spectral information of a four level system during the time evolution. And we can see that if you look at the, the lowest eigenpath, so the eigenpath with smallest eigenvalue, we can see that so this path is gapped or it's separated from the rest of the spectrum for the entire time period. And then we will call this, this eigenpath to satisfy the so called the gap condition. But if we look at the second, the third, so they somehow they somehow meet during the evolution, so they do not satisfy the gap condition. So this is an uh, understanding of so-called gap condition. And then under this gap condition, so if we start with the uh, eigenvector, for example, corresponding to the zero eigenvalue of H0, and then we solve the Schroeder equation, then we will end up with the eigenvector uh, corresponding to H1 with the, the smallest eigenvalue. We will largely follow the lowest eigenpath. And so I just mentioned that. So for the final solution, it is just approximation of the eigenvector of H1. So how good this kind of approximation can be? 
And this turns out to be a very important question and it can be described by so-called the quantum adiabatic theorem. So, and also there are many, many a different version of the adiabatic theorem. So here I just show you, show you one of them. That is the error can be bounded in terms of this equation 16. So in the equation 16, we can say that there is a linear dependence in terms of one over capital T, which is consistent with our intuition that we should make the capital T to be, to be large enough. So, and, and then the error, if T is large enough, then the error will be small. And also there are some uh, polynomial dependence in terms of the uh, inverse gap. And so if we wanna bound this adiabatic error by some epsilon, then a sufficient condition is that we should choose our evolution capital T to be very large and it should be as large as something like one over epsilon. So this is something that the adiabatic theorem tells us. And now, so far it is still not a quantum algorithm because now we use the adiabatic quantum computing to transfer the eigenvalue problem to a time-dependent Schwarzer equation, but we still need to design the quantum algorithm to solve that Schwarzer equation. And the method that we are using, again, is the Trotter formula. So we would like to understand what is the complexity or what is the error of this kind of uh, time discretization. So when talking about the Trotter for adiabatic dynamics, here is something that I would like to use which I call the error triangle for trollerization for adiabatic dynamics. So basically we have three things in this kind of procedure. So the first is so-called the numerical output. It's basically the, uh, the, the, uh, the thing that we, we obtain after we do the trotter method for the adiabatic dynamics. So this is something we get numerically. And a, a second thing is the exact eigenvector. So this is something that we don't know and we wanna get a good approximation. So, there is a third thing, which is exactly uh, the exact solution of the dynamics. So it can be viewed as kind of like a intermediate thing because it does not really uh, appear explicitly in our algorithm, but it turns out to be a useful way to understand the error. So here's just something. And by this triangle, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that. So actually the error uh, on a, uh, one arbitrary edge can be bounded by the sum of uh, the two other edges. So this is the way that we understand the error between all of this stuff. And now uh, remember that in the AQC setup, we are trying to solve the eigenvalue problem. So the error that we are really interested in is the, uh, is the bottom edge. That is the difference between the numerics and the exact eigenvector. And standard way to analyze the error is that we just uh, bound it by the sub of the other, other two edges, that is the, the error of the trotter and the error within this kind of adiabatic. And now we will do this to see what we can get. So for example, we use the first order trotter again, and then the trotter error is something like capital T times H. So remember that the local error is H squared. So the global error is basically, we just multiply the number of the, time, um, number of the trotter steps. So it becomes capital T times H. So now we want to bound the, the final error, so a sufficient condition is that we want to bound the trotter error and the adiabatic error simultaneously by some epsilon. And to do that, we just want to bound this trotter error by epsilon, which gave us an estimate for the time step size. So my time step size should be something like epsilon over capital T. And then the number of the time step size should be something like T squared over epsilon. And and from the previous slides, we already know that to bound the adiabatic error by epsilon, so this capital T should be something like one over epsilon. And then this will give us the final complexity estimate that the total number of the trotter steps should scale something like one over epsilon Q. But here the point is that to control the trotter error, so the standard method is, is telling us that the time step size should be small enough, like epsilon over capital T for the first order trotter. But I would like to say that there is a gap between the theoretical understanding and, and the, the heuristic or the experimental result. That is, so there are many, many numerical tests in the literature of uh, adiabatic quantum computing or the quantum annealing. So in, in, in their setup, in their numerical setup, they just use a relatively large time step size and they observe that the error within the trotter is not that large, even with a relatively large time step size. So we really don't need the very small time step size. And, and so now we would like to understand this theoretically and try to uh, 
um, try to bridge the gap between the theory and the, uh, and, and the heuristic. So the way that we are trying to understand this is a new tool, so-called the discrete adiabatic theorem. So the discrete adiabatic theorem can be dated back to 1998, but uh, in, in, in our recent work, we just proved a refined version. And I believe in the next talk, so Dominic will talk more about this discrete adiabatic theorem in more detail. So here I just uh, briefly show you the, the result here. So to understand the discrete adiabatic theorem can be uh, understand as an analog of the continuous adiabatic theories. So, uh, so, uh, uh, maybe we can just directly go to the next comparison, which can be a little bit clear. It means that remember that in the continuous adiabatic theorem, so the evolution that we are given is a time-dependent Schroeder equation, and assume that the Hamiltonian is changing slowly and assume we have some gap condition, then the conclusion is that we can go from the eigenvector of the initial Hamiltonian to the eigenvector of the final Hamiltonian by solving this uh, Schroeder equation. And in the discrete, so everything is quite similar. So instead of a continuous uh, Schroeder equation, so we are actually given a discrete walk evolution. That is, so we are given a sequence of the walk operators W0, W1 over capital T, all the way to W of W of 1. So now we are given the sequence of walk operators. So the evolution we are considering is that we apply our walk operators sequentially to some, some input state. And we also put two assumptions. So the, the first assumption, the slow assumption that we assume my discrete unitary operator is changing slowly. That is the difference between the adjacent walk operators are, are just quite small. So uh, the second assumption is so-called the gap condition and here, since we do not have the uh, Hamiltonian anymore. So the gap condition is assumed for the unitary operator. And I would like to remark that here is it is kind of different from assuming the gap condition for the Hamiltonian and for the unitary, and I will just discuss this at the end of the talk. But so far, we just assume that, okay, we have some gap condition for our unitary wall operator. And under these uh, 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 assumptions, so the conclusion that we have is that if our input state is the eigenvector corresponding to my first uh, walk unitary operators, then the final solution after this kind of a discrete evolution will be a very good approximation of my, uh, a fight of my last unitary operators, which means that we can go from the eigenvector corresponding to W0 all the way to the eigenvector corresponding to W1. So we can see that they are just very similar. And so if you, if you just want to look at some explicit error bound, you can see that the, the form of the explicit error bound are also similar. We have some boundary term, and we have some integral term in the continuous case and the summation term in the discrete case. And now we would like to use this kind of discrete adiabatic theorem tool to understand uh, how the Trotter error is behavior in the, in, the, in the adiabatic dynamics. And it turns out that the discrete adiabatic theorem can provide a single step to directly bound the error that we want, which means that Actually, the, this bottom edge, the arrow between the numerical output and the exact eigenvector can be directly bounded by using the discrete adiabatic theorem. So the idea is that, so we just look at the algorithm that we have, we use the first order order to discretize the dynamics. So this is something that we will use. That is, we sequentially apply my trotter, the, my, my short time trotter operator to my initial state, and then, so this is exactly in the form of the discrete adiabatic evolution. So now we view our Trotter evolution operator, uh, operator as the discrete walk operator. And then we can, we, can, we can see that if this kind of Trotter evolution operator can satisfy my assumptions, then the error can be directly bounded. So for the assumptions, I will just also put the gap condition later to the next slide. I would just like to describe, describe the slow changing uh, assumption. And it turns out that if we choose the time step size to be one, so now we don't choose a small time step size. We choose my time step size to be one. So the corresponding Trotter evolution operator is given in this form. And you can actually prove that it is already slow enough. So the reason is that, so we are doing some uh, a slow linear interpolation between H0 and H1. And this kind of slow linear interpolation can help us control the speed of my Trotter walk operator. 
So basically, there's no need for us to further decrease the time step size. So we can just prove that if I just choose a, a, a time step size to be one, and then this walk operator will satisfy the uh, slow condition. And then we directly use our discrete abetic theorem is saying that, okay, so the arrow within the, this edge, the bottom edge can be bounded by something like one over capital T, which means that if we really want to bound this arrow by epsilon, then we can directly choose capital T to be something like one over epsilon. And the number of the shorter steps is same to is same as the, uh, the evolution time T and this feels something like one over epsilon. And the most remarkable thing that we get is the time step. So here we only use the order one time step instead of a small enough time step. So this is uh, at least um, when I first see this result, I'm kind of surprised. I'm kind of surprised on this result because this is something that we don't uh, really expect for, for, for general time discretization of the dynamics, but it really happens for the uh, trauralization for adiabatic dynamics. And here comes a byproduct that is so the trotter arrow in the, in the adiabatic dynamics is indeed not dominant. So this is because if we go back to see this kind of triangle, so we have the trotter arrow. So the trotter arrow can also be bounded by the summation of the other two edges. So the summation of the continuous and discrete adiabatic arrow. And we know that for both of them, they are on the same order. So the trotter arrow, even with time step size one, will not be dominant. And also another remark is that we can further prove that the first order trotter can even achieve a astonishing exponential convergence. So the, uh, I just cannot finish this argument within two or three minutes. So I just uh, probably I'll just skip this. So if you're interested, maybe you can just talk something offline, but I will just uh, go to my next slides. That is the remarks of this kind of way. So here's the table that summarizes what we have already got, that is, if we use the standard way to analyze the trotter error within the adiabatic dynamics, then the trotter time step size should be small enough. And also this, this will happen in many other, in, in time discretization for many other dynamics. But in our work, we show that for the adiabatic dynamics, indeed you can use a order one time step size. And also you only need to use the first order trotter. And that is sufficient for us to get the accuracy. So it seems that our conclusion is kind of strong, but if we compare with the generic trotter error, so there's some caveat of our result, that is we actually require more assumption. That is, we require the gap condition. Well, in the generic theory for the trotter error, there's no gap condition. And furthermore, the gap condition is required for the unitary walk operator instead of the original Hamiltonian. So this can be a very important difference because if we, for example, if we take a look at the first order trotter, we can see that even if we assume the gap condition for the Hamiltonian, which is, seems quite natural, actually we don't know whether we have the gap condition for the walk operator corresponding to the first order trotter, because here we just split the Hamiltonian and after this splitting, actually we don't know what is happening. So uh, fortunately in the, like some numerical test has already showed that so, so the gap condition between the uh, Hamiltonian and the walk operator, they are quite similar, which means that if we are given the gap condition for one, then probably we will have some gap condition for the other, but these are just some numerical observations. And theoretically, so we still don't understand the, the connection between these two gap conditions. And that is something that we would like to understand it more uh, theoretically. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, conclude my talk and, and thank you all for listening.